All right, I don't need to wear that. And happy Saturday, everybody. I hope everybody's having a great day so far. Um, and thank you for joining in. Today's episode 33. I'm just, I'm on a few minutes early. We're going to uh, let everybody join us and then we're going to go ahead and start our show off. Today is really going to be a great show, but all about marine protected areas and what's going on right now and what else do we need to do in order to change everything. Hey, I see Molly's there. Hey, Molly. Hey, Coralie. Thanks for joining. Hi, Andrea. Thanks for joining today. It's nice to see everybody on here. And ah, good, Molly. Good. I know you're eating organically and healthy. So <clears throat> that's definitely the number one number one thing, um, especially right now. It's good to keep the immunity systems boosted. Hello, Mitch. Good to see you, man. Thank you for being on today. It's nice to see Mitch back on here again. Um, Mitch is a tireless activist, and so is Molly. And uh, actually, so is Coralie. And it's really impressive, you know, to have everybody here working on various topics. Uh, Andrea doesn't work in conservation, but she does work with a lot of different kids and she actually does a lot of charities to help uh, underprivileged children. So we've got a great mix of, uh, of everybody joining us today. So welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, gonna give everybody another minute to get on here. You know, we're gonna start doing Saturdays because we found out that it's just a little bit easier for everybody. It's a little bit better of a day, you know, uh, we're all kind of getting back to work now and, um, you know, I have to deal with that all day. So, <laughs> you know, let's, uh, we may as well continue forward as best we can. So uh, today we're going to talk about marine protected areas. And by the way, it's episode 33 and it's really exciting because on August 11th last year was the very first Conservation Conversation podcast. So um, we're going to be celebrating a year coming up in uh, on the 11th. So I'm pretty excited about that. So thank you all because I know that every one of these um, people that I see all, all the time, everybody I'm looking at right now that's commented has actually been on the show for close to a year. And the show is just because everybody contributes and that's what makes it really happen. And I'm really excited. Think about it. We've been talking about conservation topics for about a year now. And I know there's no shortage of topics, but um, there's never any shortage of, of need for activism but there's also no shortage of activists. <laughs> That's been the most comforting and beautiful element of what I've seen over this last year, getting to host this podcast and getting to talk to everybody about different topics. So it means a lot. Why don't we go ahead and start off today, episode All right, welcome back. Episode 33, MPAs. Uh, what are MPAs? If you're not familiar with them, they are marine protected areas. So we'll talk a little bit about that today, what it is and what's happening in the world at the moment and how we can help with these MPAs. Uh, I had actually the privilege um, in 2018 to go help protect a bunch of MPAs throughout the Philippines and Cambodia. And uh, it was quite an amazing experience. And I don't think people understand enough of, of what's going on out there on the fishing grounds. You know, we all have this image of a very holistic, you know, um, small crew of three, you know, and the guy owns his own boat and lives in the, you know, um, lives up in the Northeast, you know, um, and everybody's, you know, gets paid and it's this nice adventure together. In fact, um, the fishing industry is so huge that what, what I found out there were uh, battles on the ocean over fishing grounds. And there are battles everywhere over fishing grounds. Uh, we found vessels from every sea, every different port. Oh, somebody's in trouble out here. Uh, you hear that quite often out here. <laughs> it is Los Angeles. But we found everybody around the world suffered from this aspect of, of what's going on with the fishing. And the problem is, is there's a lot of overfishing by industrial size fleets and they are destroying the smaller fishermen's living. So it's a tricky aspect because today when we talk about MPAs. We, we were talking about a division that's kind of fascinating that I always am fascinated with um, is environmentalism versus conservation. Now, 
the reason I bring that up is that environmentalism by definition means that people should never touch these areas. And conservation is the idea that we need to conserve wildlife resources for human use. So the two are kind of um, at opposition to each other, and but they're used interchangeably. And that is something that I think is, a, is also a fascinating aspect. But they are fundamentally philosophically opposed to how each other works. And why I bring that up is because that's what we've got going on today when it comes to marine protected areas. So marine protected areas are basically areas that are set up that are no fishing, no take, and no human activity or interaction zones. Um, now, the MPAs are all around the world, and they've actually allowed fisheries to bounce back. Now, the reason it's really important is because we're, today we're going to talk about how our actions can affect the world around us and how the world around us can affect sometimes our choices and our actions that we have to take. But we're going to start off today with one of my favorite parts, as you all know, is the quote of the day. So today's quote is a great one. But man is a part of nature, and his war against nature is inevitably a war against himself. Rachel Carson, who, as we all know, is one of the most incredible pioneers in advocating conservation around the states. And always, always a treat to be able to find another quote and bring that from her. So, uh, and that's what we're talking about today, because when we talk about fisheries, it always seems so distant from everybody in their minds, but it comes back to what we have going here. Now, today what we're going to talk about is not, you know, the issues of, of fishing, but more about what MPAs are, how they can protect what little fisheries we have left. But first, let's go into taking a look at, at a few aspects to understand this clearer. Um, you know, we always talk about the Earth, but when you think about it, the Earth really is ocean. There's over 70% of the world is covered by water. Uh, now, out of the Earth's surface, almost half of it is covered by the high seas. Now, the high seas are important because these are unregulated areas beyond the 200 nautical mile offshore limit of national jurisdiction, where there is no law comprehens comprehensively to protect the ocean environment. Now, why that's really important is because within 200 miles of any border, the country owns that land, and it's called an economic exclusive zone. Okay, so technically, people aren't even supposed to be in there fishing um, unless they've been given permission by the powers that be within that 200 mile range. Um, so, uh, you know, that that is one uh, the first aspect. Now. The second aspect is, I mean, fishing is, is massive. Here in America, uh, it's 5.6 billion. And this is from 2017, so it's actually risen a little bit. 5.6 billion in profits. And you can see all the different things that they fish for and the amounts that they, they bring in, which means that it is a huge a source of income for a lot of people. And so preserving it and keeping it safe is a super important aspect. Now, um, currently, the... Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations estimates that 60% of the world fisheries are fully fished. And that means they have collapsed. Um, a few of those fisheries that I'd like to bring up are the Atlantic cod, um, the orange ruffy, actually, which now has protection, and a few of the others around the world. Now, the fisheries that are left, so, out, okay, so we'll get rid of the 60. We have 40% of the fisheries left. Out of those, 33% are overfished. Now, this picture is on a giant purse saner fishing fleet and we boarded this boat they were fishing illegally inside of tribal protected mpa waters they were pulling out approximately 20 million pounds of fish an evening just this one purse saner so when we're talking about this you know we're talking about these guys coming in taking 20 million pounds of fish and the local fishermen are, are left with nothing and they are starving and this is a massive, massive issue. Uh, Mitch says, uh, hope you will join the rights of nature. Nature has no standing in court. This is what rights of nature is working to change. Mitch, I love that. And I do think rights of nature is an incredible movement. Um, and it's very important, especially in America, where the there is a lack of 
of understanding. Now, rights of nature, as I understand it, and Mitch, correct me if I'm wrong, people sometimes get it confused. Um, it's not saying that the lake becomes a person because the corporations are people, but what it's saying is that um, it deserves protection uh, as communal public property instead of allowing it to be inside of a, any kind of a private area. And what they want to do is create zones where people cannot go in. Rights of nature, very similar to um, marine protected areas. The idea is, you know, these areas deserve legal protection. And so Mitch, I'm glad you brought it up because it really is the same thing as the marine protected areas. And again, I am a huge fan of the rights of nature movement. I am a huge fan of the concept of it. And I'm a huge fan of of the changes that already have been done through rights of nature. And if you're not familiar with them, you can go online and check it out. Maybe Mitch, you can pop a, a, a good link uh, on a spot down there. I know, especially in Florida right now, they're trying to fight back because in Florida, the legislators often work against the people. And there was a recent legislation that they passed um, that sounded like it was there to, to help, um, to help the waters. But what it actually did was it, excluded home rule, which is a very important thing in Florida. It excluded home rule where the communities can take care of their own environments. And it excluded them to allow to preserve environments, which means basically that it's just opening the door for oil and gas companies or whoever wants to come in to exploit the particular lands that we have. And this is the problem is our lands and our water have been losing a lot of protection. Um, and this is, you know, this, this is a major issue here. Okay. Mitch says that was correct. Thanks, Mitch, because some people say, well, you know, I don't understand this now, but you know, um, everybody really does need to understand the rights of nature. It's an organic movement. Um, it has a very, um, I think honest approach to, you know, nature, you know, corporations and people as a general rule didn't have so many rights that could destroy nature as we do now. And as we know, all of those protections have been deleted. And actually, we're going to talk about that today because that's a major issue with MPAs. Uh, hey, Camille, thanks for Camilla. Thanks for being on today. And uh, it's good to see you. And um, thanks for being on. And, uh, you know, I know that um, Camilla is always over there um, checking out water testing and a major activist as well. Uh, and this is something as well, you know, I know Camilla is um, <laughs> Molly instead of Millie. Camilla is somebody who tries to warn people about the dangers of eating fish due to overfishing. And especially uh, when we talk about fish, we have to be careful because we have to remember that a lot of the bigger fish like tuna carry tons of mercury. We have to remember that you have to eat everything in a small amount and also remember where it's caught from because... What happens with these MPAs, and I've seen this firsthand out on, the, out on the South China Seas, is you have these borders and the fleets line up and then they cross the border. You, you start to catch them, you go, and then they cross the border right before you can catch them and then you have no authority to do anything. And again, that goes back to the definition of the high seas that we just talked about. So the MPAs are really essential because they are going to stay focused on keeping people out of these areas. Uh, now, what is an MPA? Let's just start back at the beginning. Real fast, I want to take everybody through the important part. Uh, and real fast, Molly did say Lake O is full of green gunk. Uh, Molly, I've been seeing pictures. Lake O is in a hideous sense right now. Uh, Molly says it's over 13 foot right now. Hurricane on the way. Cyanobacteria. The hurricane's going to come in. And um, you know what? Actually, before we get to MPAs, let's just address what Molly's talking about. Um, you know, within, okay, Lake O supposedly has a certain amount of inches that it has to maintain for storms, hurricanes, et cetera, et cetera, that's considered like a safety margin. It was ridiculous when you think about it because if a hurricane comes through, you know, uh, and the rain falls, um, Molly uh, has shown me over there that it's basically a, a giant blender, you know, so you're getting this cyanobacteria in, in the middle of all of this lake. Uh, you've also got cyanobacteria being used as bioremediation in multiple phosphate mines around the state. And then you bring in a hurricane and the, the cyanobacteria is going to be thrown into all the groundwater and all of the groundwaters that will go out to the Gulf. And what will happen is it will change. The salinity will change. And when the cyanobacteria, uh, which can be used in bioremediation in a certain salinity, right, it goes down the river. 
and then as soon as it hits the Gulf, there's a brand new salinity and it basically explodes, carrying with it everything it took. And when it's used for bioremediation, that means that it's taking heavy metals. It means it's taking radiation. It means it's taking, you know, um, polonium, chromium, uh, all of the things, and it's trying to suck it out of that water. And then it gets released and accidentally thrown in to the Gulf and uh, also feeds um, as we know, the, the, it's part of the, you know, the green, blue, blue algae issue. Uh, I will also mention that phosphate mining, phosphate is a feeder of green, blue algae, of green algae, of algae, the algae blooms. It's called eutrophication. And when they put their stuff into the water, it goes out and it goes out there and it also mixes with everything. And that's why Florida, among many other reasons, is having massive blooms that are pretty uncontrollable. So um, sending all my love to Florida. I know you guys have some terrible, terrible weather coming up. And it's been it's been pretty dangerous out there for you all. And the danger is these companies say that they can protect the public, but obviously they can't because look at the hurricanes. How do you how do you think you're gonna keep all of your pollution on your land when a hurricane is just swirling everything up and throwing everything everywhere like a giant blender? It's an absurd concept that man thinks they can take over nature um, and control it. And we know that we can't, and we, it comes back at us all the time, bites back at us all the time. Hey, Stell, thanks for being on today. Um, so, yeah, I'm glad we wanted to talk about that uh, because that is really important. And, again, you know, Florida has some of the, the, the most difficult journeys ahead of it, but they also have some of the best activism. <clears throat> and it's always a place to look because companies are always trying to take a chunk and the activists are always trying to preserve a chunk. And it is an ongoing battle. And if those activists weren't out there every day at those BOCC meetings and talking to each other in private groups and Facebook groups and getting the word out through Facebook groups, these private industries would just be take, 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 taking. And they were until the 70s and a lot of new consciousness. Like when Earth Day started, 1970. Um, anyway, Sherry says it's not just in Florida. Lake Erie is ah, dealing with the same. We must connect the dots. Absolutely, Sherry. And you know what, Sherry? That's the point. It is a great point you make. What's going on in Florida is going on in every single state right now. Um, it's so bad that the Gulf of Mexico has been declared a dead zone because everybody's pollution and, and chemicals and everything is all bleeding out into there. You have the Ohio River, which was considered the most, uh, the dirtiest, uh, most polluted river in all of America. And that bleeds into the Mississippi, which then runs through an area that I always talk about called Cancer Alley, which is about 85 miles of chemical companies uh, along the river that pollute into the poor neighborhoods there. And also, they also have an air pollution thing. Now, they say that living there, I have seen estimates but um, your chances are anywhere from 60 up to potentially 600 times the chance of getting cancer if you live in Cancer Alley. So Ohio brings all those pollutants that everybody, you know, comes from all those farms and all those neighborhoods and all the water treatment and all the mining and all the extraction sector and everything. And then it rolls down and then it goes through the Mississippi out into the Gulf. So the veins of our country are being poisoned and our country is slowly dying as a result. And Sherry, you're absolutely right. It's a whole nationwide problem. Now, uh, it all drains to the Gulf. Yep, see, and that is, and I know Lake Erie has, had, has, has been having a lot of battles. Uh, Ohio is a, a leader in the rights of nature movement and how they have approached trying to get the, uh, the lake a lot of rights. And you know what's great is, again, it brings us back to the MPAs because the MPAs are sort of a global concept of having a rights of nature movement. Um, so what I wanted to do real fast is let's just talk about an MPA. What is it? Uh, it's actually, it's like an underwater national park. Um, it creates a no take zone, right? Over a certain amount size. And it's it's got very definitive borders. Uh, we'll show you a picture here in a second. There's over 10,000 MPAs in the world and we still have this problem, um, which I think can be difficult. Now, <clears throat> There is a goal set by the International Convention on Biological Diversity. And if you're not familiar with the Convention on Biological Diversity, it is a worldwide meeting of countries where everybody strives to work together in order to curb potential resource 
dangers in the future. Um, now, I do have to bring up right now, the United States has willfully never participated in the Center on Biological Diversity. They did not sign any agreements ever with the Center of Biological Diversity. And, um, you know, politics sometimes does get dropped into environmentalism. I'll say at this moment that this has been a United States policy. We have been very uh, ignorant towards our universal um, responsibilities, you know, uh, ecologically. And this is not a, a partisan thing. We're talking about multiple presidents, multiple political parties, all have with, refused to be part of the Convention of Biological Diversity. So I just want to throw that out there. Please don't think it's it's a one way or the other politics. Uh, that's not really the conversation we're having here today. The conversation we're having is how can we preserve what we have left? Um, so the Center on, Center Convention, sorry, boop, doop, 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 rewind. The Convention on Biological Diversity had a plan to fully protect 10% of the coastal and marine areas by the entire world by this year in 2020. Uh, so far, they've estimated approximately 2% have been um, protected. <clears throat> it's not much. Now, marine protected areas uh, are a smart investment in ocean health. Now, the, the MPAs, what happens is that a lot of times it's in conflict because when they have an MPA, it's a no-take zone. So a lot of P, uh, fishermen um, feel that this can be an issue, and we will address this. But um, MPAs have always been proven to not only succeed, but they bounce back beautifully. They bounce back um, ecosystems that are on the verge of biodiverse collapse. They bounce back animals that are on the verge of extinction. And basically, if we just don't touch nature, it, do, it does its own thing. People always say we, they don't need us. And there's nothing truer to that statement. We just need to leave them alone. Um, a great example is the orange roughy, which is a fish that grows, uh, can, I think, uh, gets up to like one to 200 years old. And they get massive. And so the fishermen started killing all of them and selling them. And Orange Ruffy became very popular and they almost went extinct. So they banned allowing uh, any more Orange Ruffy to be sold. And the Orange Ruffies have been hands off. And guess what? They're bouncing back. It is a beautiful success story. It's not a success story that anyone's going to be eating them anytime soon because they need to mature. And that takes about 100 years. But um, we stopped one extinction. You know, we... We mourn so many extinctions and we can stop them. So I think we need to focus more on the ones we can stop than more on the ones that we um, read about in the news every day. Anyway, overall, less than 4% of the oceans are designated for protection. Now, the reason I bring this up is because we all have heard recently about Ecuador. Um, they're on alert, right? Uh, all these Chinese fishing ships have shown up in the Galapagos, and the Galapagos is a World Heritage Site. It's a protected site. It is um, one of the most important spots for biodiversity in the world. And because it's been protected for so long, and the world's fisheries, as we just talked about, 60% have collapsed and 33% are overfished, that only leaves approximately 7% of fisheries left for exploitation. Now, that's very problematic. So we've all been talking about, oh my gosh, all the Chinese are going to go steal all the fish out of the Galapagos. That's a huge issue. <clears throat> and the Navy's working on it. Uh, a lot of my friends that I know are over there trying to work on it right now. Um, it's something that really needs to be done. There needs to be protection. The reason this is happening goes back to those high seas thing again. Now you got to remember the Galapagos is hundreds and hundreds of miles off of the coast of Ecuador. So it's a very protected, but never a patrolled really area. Um, this is the problem is most countries never put money out for enforcement. So like I said, when I was out there with, uh, for example, in the Philippines with the Navy, we were on a small speedboat, but we would find people and we would get to them. By the time we got to them, they had gone over the edge. So it happens in the Cocos Islands. Uh, if you're familiar with that out in uh, Costa Rica, lots and lots of, um, of illegal fishing in the Cocos, lots of illegal fishing uh, all around. You know, we personally battled trawlers in Cambodia uh, and they were out, you know, they're not joking around. They were trying to ram our boat, sink us. They were shooting at us. They were, you know, flinging rocks at us. Um, fishing 
the, as the fishing grounds become smaller and smaller, every country, it becomes more and more desperate. It leads to more fish fraud. People are eating. They don't even know what they're eating anymore. There's just a bunch of hungry countries running around trying to grab fish and then sell it to other countries. Uh, very often leaving their own countries starving. That's the other thing is most domestic fish is exported. Um, and then most fish eaten in the country is imported. It literally makes no sense. But it's what's happening because we are scrambling. Nobody really, it, you know, I mean, obviously scientists have been talking about this for years, but, you know, it takes politicians. That's the thing. It takes a connection of the politicians um, and the people that are studying the ocean with us in between making sure that it happens in order for these things to, to continue. Um, Mitch said, I believe they have passed some rights of nature laws. Yeah, see, that's, and that's great. So that is, uh, you know, that's what we need. We need people defending the local bodies of water because there's always going to be invaders. You know, I mean, for lots of the rights of nature, it has to do with uh, bottling water. Um, sometimes there's pipelines that they plan to put through. So, you know, we're talking about Ecuador and the danger of the Chinese ships and everybody always talks about the Asian fleets. You know, we were in the Philippines. There was Vietnamese boats that were um, finning sharks and giving them to the local Philippine fishermen. And, you know, these guys, you got to remember, too, when they're coming from China and Vietnam, their fisheries have collapsed. So, like, when I tried to get on a fishing boat in Vietnam, they said it would be a three-week journey because they have to travel for about a week just to get to the fishing grounds. So they're on these massive boats, and they come in, these huge boats, fleets of them. And, you know, most of the local guys are on these smaller boats, pulling in smaller catches. And the bigger boats, sometimes they'll try to, to run them over and sink them. Sometimes, I mean, they attack. It is a very vicious thing. It is no joke. There is a battlefield right now, and it is on the water. I have personally experienced it. <laughs> um, I, I've never had boats try to sink my boat before. I've never had such aggression. I've never had such um, craziness and desperation. And, you know, the sad part is the guys that get the kind of the brunt of it are the, the small fishermen. Um, but we got to remember it's the ship owners and the captains and the people that are out there, you know, not the not the poor fishermen guys. Um, they're the lowest, you know, on the fruit, uh, hanging fruit. And, you know, getting rid of a few of those guys isn't going to make any difference. Um, you know, some countries have fantastic approaches. There are some countries that if they catch a, a ship that's coming in illegal fishing, they will scuttle and sink it. And, you know, um, that is something really important to maybe think about in the future. We need stronger penalties for this. Now, as we've talked about, Ecuador, right? China's coming in. We're all thinking this is terrible. How could they remove, you know, like what about marine protection? What about marine protection? Well, what if I explained that right now in the United States, we're actually doing the same thing, but legally, and everyone's cheering it on. So um, at the moment, there are a lot of areas that had protection, and those areas uh, are now being publicly offered up to oil and gas companies. As of December 2018, the U.S. had over approximately, you see there, around 17 million acres of publicly owned land that they were auctioning off to oil and gas companies. Uh, now, that's more than the size of Maryland and New Jersey combined. I'm from Maryland. I'm like, that's crazy. Uh, okay, most of the lands offered for leasing are in the top 25% of the wildest places in the contiguous U.S. and the top 25 most important areas for wildlife connectivity, which means biodiverse. It means where all the animals come together, where all the magic happens, and nature as we know it continues without our, you know, without our help or need. They've already got the whole thing worked out perfectly. Nature is perfect as it is. It literally does not need us here. Uh, now, off our coast is the biggest problem. Off our coast, the U.S. is now offering over 81 million acres of water to the oil and gas industry. So this is a big issue. Um, it's going to be massive. Now, that is removing protections that were here in the, the 20, uh, from 2016. We'll talk about that right now. Uh, what I want to do is show you guys a map of 
the area that is right now has been reopened. And this is a marine protected area uh, near Cop Cape Cod. It's approximately 5,000 square miles or so. Um, in June 2020, the United States removed fishing restrictions within the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument. Now, inside of that little triangle there, you're going to see those are the seamounts. Those are basically um, pieces that come up from the ocean floor. Now, this for, since 2016 was an established exclusive economic zone in the Atlantic Ocean, encompassing a majority of the strongly protected marine areas around it, removing Fishing restrictions here eliminates 84% of the ocean protections within all of the United States. This one MPA will eliminate 84% of ocean protections that we have. Uh, they're going to bring in trawlers. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with trawlers, but trawlers um, come in and they have these giant weights and there's these giant nets that go down to the ground. Here, wait, let's talk about this for a sec. So um, they have these giant nets and with weights on them. Uh, in Cambodia, actually, they add electricity. They do electric trawling, which is highly destructive. But trawlers have giant nets and they're indiscriminate. They just, they roll along the bottom of the seafloor, killing everything on the seafloor and scooping up everything in a gigantic nets. Um, and then when they bring it on board, a lot of animals die. They're called bycatch. And this is where we are losing a lot of animals through this horrible, horrible practice of fishing. This is a type of fishing that should be stopped. Now, they're going to open it. Now, they've reopened this MPA <clears throat> where the fish are starting to bounce back. And one thing else about this MPA that, that's very interesting uh, that I want to share with you guys is, let's see, MPA destruction. Um, one thing I wanted to share with you is if you look at that triangle where the MPA is, that's not where people fish. Um, see at the cor top corner there, you can see where the land is. See the continental shelf? It goes down deep. So that's where they're going to start trawling. Now, what's happening here is that most of the fishermen from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, in that area don't fish out there. So the MPA never hurt the fishermen's ability to make a living. And that is why it was repealed. That was the reasoning used to repeal it, that it was hurting fishermen. They don't fish out there, the majority of them. The ones that do are huge commercial projects that trawl and are extremely destructive and it should not be open to commercial fishing. This is a death warrant for biodiversity. Those canyons we were just looking at are home to 54 species of deep sea corals. Um, that's incredible. We are about to, I mean, just imagine the amount of corals we're about to lose. We're trying to preserve coral, <laughs> not get rid of it. So this is a massive, massive problem. Um, now aside, so, you know, the MPA again, you know, it's something to remember is that MPAs do not hurt fishermen. They're generally set up in areas where it allows the most bi where the most biodiversity happens. So you have the most amount of animals working together to build up their natural stock elements again. And they don't usually, they, it, nobody fishes out there aside from commercial destructive fishing, which is what they needed the protection from in 2016. So the, the removal of it is absolutely ridiculous. Again, the fishermen do not travel that far out, nor do they go down to 4,000 meters with their smaller fishing boats. It's an incons inconsistency and comprehension. Small, the fishermen that are smaller, that are the ones that are actually benefiting from the MPA because all of the fish stocks are coming back, fish closer to inshore. So the MPA never hurt any fishermen. If anything now, um, fishermen are about to really, are about to become an endangered species, possibly themselves. Because when you remove that biodiversity, we already have weak fish stocks out there. And a lot of the people that work in Cape Cod have seen a lot of their money disappearing. And a lot of the fishermen are struggling to survive. And again, we come back to conservation versus environmentalism. Conservation is the, the preservation of natural resource for human use versus environmentalism, which is uh, do not touch nature and it'll be fine. So an MPA, in a sense, is an environmental act. And... Um, you know, they, uh, but it's for a conservation purpose. 
And in the end, it works. You know, um, in the Philippines, we never, you know, the, the people that were in there were either very desperate or were major companies that went in. So um, let's see. Uh, Sherry says it's political water. The protections are for the corporations, not for the nature or the community. Absolutely, Sherry. I agree 100%. Um, and as we've seen right now, the MPA was reopened just for commercial fishermen and not even for our own commercial fishermen. There will be uh, a lot of people taking and stealing out of that MPA. And as I said, you know, just imagine it as like a square, you know. Oh, here we go, square. <laughs> I can't, I'm, doing, I'm seeing it backwards. But imagine a square. And inside of that square is the MPA. The fishermen will, you know, the, the illegal fishing groups will hang out right outside of that border of that square, jump inside, catch what they can. Sometimes they even leave their processing ships right outside. So the smaller ships, like on purse saners or other things, um, purse saners where they lay a gigantic net and indiscriminately, the boat just tightens the net and then takes it to the processor and it goes up. And uh, it's another extremely destructive fashion of fishing that is insane. Um, but now our one marine protected area we have is now open for that kind of fishing. It is going to be destructive. It is going to destroy the quality of life for the fishermen in all of the areas there. And uh, as I said, quite possibly turn us more towards um, destruction of and keeping fishing alive even in our country. Um, personally, I don't eat fish because, you know, there's too many toxins, there's too many microplastics, there's too much mercury. You don't know where the fish comes from. Uh, and I'm a vegan, so I don't really eat anything with a face. <laughs> um, it just as a simple rule. It gets more complicated than that. But, you know, um, yeah, so I don't even eat fish. So, But my friends that do, uh, you have to understand that we have to be more responsible about what, about, about what we eat and where we get it from. Um, if you're buying frozen cheap tilapia for like a dollar for 900 fillets, you know, like I understand. I mean, I understand, you know. Um, money's really tight these days. But at the same time, the things that you're doing to your health are insane. Um, you know, this is not, we can no longer do, the, the ocean is not bountiful. The ocean is collapsing. We've lost over 90% of our sharks that are bigger than uh, about a meter to two meters, I believe. So that means most of the sharks left are like, you know, little horn sharks and stuff you can hold in your hand when you go fishing. The big sharks that are out there, everybody's afraid of them and they're destroying them. Our ocean is begging. Our ocean is, is pleading and our ocean needs protection, just like our local groundwaters need protection from the rights of nature group. Um, our oceans, our high seas that have nobody looking out for them need this. Uh, hi, Elena. Hello from R Romania. Uh, Buno ziua. <laughs> and that means uh, good afternoon in Romanian. Um, Mitch says, stay away from fish. Since, okay, I'm, I'm interested. Oh, thank you, Mitch, for putting up that uh, link as well to the Center for Environmental Rights. You know, right now it's beautiful because we see this huge movement in everybody all around the world understanding that things are more limited. Water resources. And what little water we have is so critical. So the problem is we, we've lost our marine protected area. We've lost 84% of our protected ocean waters off the coast and the problem is is that um and now you know this is something that excuse me this is a complicated topic because we're talking now about oil extraction in our, in our waters around the states uh this one's complicated because we all drive cars everybody is a contributor to this form of it but you know we have these antiquated systems that still run on fossil fuels every time a new idea comes out it gets like battered down but we are literally killing ourselves to grab the things that we need for just basic necessities. We are exterminating species and we are poisoning ourselves and we are destroying our environment so that we can just get a little petrol to run to the supermarket. And it's a very self-destructive um, approach that we're on. And, you know, it's kind of like that, you know, they, you can see the lemmings running off the cliff and you're like, why don't they notice? So anyway, um, that's pretty much our, our, where we are these days. Now, I wanted to show you that in 2017, um, these are the areas 
that are now, as you can tell, uh, the area is this orange right here up around Alaska, which is actually part of a, a marine protected area and a nature preserve um, is now no longer protected. And inside of there is actually new leases being offered to oil and gas right there. And that's the same as we know right through down here, down to Louisiana, Texas. So it's the Gulf. It's basically the Gulf has been very active in here, and now it's going to be over there. So um, <clears throat> we can see that that whole uh, kind of the bigger picture of, of what we're losing as we are looking at the destruction of our lands. Um, and I'll show you in a closer version. Here's the Arctic Ocean. There's around Alaska. The area is stripped of protection. Uh, are above there, and it's actually a wildlife preserve, as you know. So, um, proposed for offshore drilling. So now you can see that every piece of Alaska is now open for offshore drilling. And offshore drilling is going to destroy, obviously, uh, fisheries as much as anything else. Um, and there it is, just as another, there's the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, which is brilliant. And unfortunately, they're opening a little bit of it now for oil and gas development. So that is nuts. Um, this is not a good idea. Um, there's, you know, we're just, yeah, we're just, you know, really we are killing our environment to sustain something in the old term. And hopefully innovations will happen. I mean, innovations got us cars to begin with. You know, this is only 100 years ago. You know, we I think after 100 years, we could probably we're wiser and we can probably move more forward. We have more collective knowledge. We've seen, imagine that, the earth has been around for a long time and within a hundred years of us industrializing, we have almost brought it to its knees. I think that's nuts. Camilla says, please leave the fish in the ocean. Bycatch means everything gets caught, exactly. Um, the images of injured fish thrown back to die are heartbreaking, absolutely, Camilla. You see the worst things in these bycatch you see tons of, not only that, but what they'll do is they bring them up quickly and very often their bladders inside explode, uh, which is an extremely painful death for the fish. So the fish that they don't keep, they throw off the side of the thing and they're paralyzed in agony, stuck it there, slowly dying and slowly suffocating until, they're, until they can't produce enough oxygen because they cannot get in the water. So they explode their... Um, yeah, their ability to, to sink and, and, you know. So it's a very um, cruel and destructive and unnecessary thing just for the convenience of people. And I agree with you, Camilla. You know, right now, there's not enough fish in the ocean. Uh, now, granted, I've been in places where, you know, in the Philippines, there was four people on the islands. They ate the fish that they caught. That is something a little different than what we're talking about now, which are opening um, marine protected areas to commercial fishing fleets. This is a suicide. It's a slow suicide, and it's not, it's not a smart move from any, any aspect. Um, let's see. Sherry says, I had to share this with you and others. This is a Do Not Miss Rights of Nature documentary. We showed this in Fort Myers last year. Uh, it is now complete and gives a great overview of the rights of nature movement. It includes many organizations, states that are on the ground, and the countries involved in making these changes. Fantastic. Well, there you go. There's a great link right there. Thank you, Sherry. Appreciate it. Uh, always good, you know, and that's the thing is we all need to educate each other because we, there's so many new approaches that are going on. And, um, and, and in accordance with the rights of nature, I'm actually glad that we, we're bringing this up because that's on our local level of how we can change things. And how do you stop this destruction of worldwide fisheries when half of them are on the high seas and the other guys are, are you know, um, straddling the border to eliminate prosecution? Most countries could care less and they do not ever patrol. Um, there is literally no enforcement. I don't know what the number is on our budget, but I can guarantee you that whatever the Coast Guard is doing, this is something they do not care about. Uh, more than likely, they're on whatever mission, you know, that is deemed important at the moment. Generally, it's um, smaller fishermen or whatever, um, but they're not out there regulating. And that's the problem is when the, the MPA was repealed, up near Cape Cod, it was repealed saying that it should be open to regulated and, and uh, well-regulated fishing industry. And that's a joke. There is no well-regulated regulated fishing industry at all. 
on a commercial scale. I'm sorry, you might be a local fisherman. Please don't be offended. But I'm talking about on, a, on an international scale. So internationally, there's the IUCN. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with them. They have a thing called the Red List. And the IUCN, the IUCN is an international group. It's an international un union for conservation of nature. They run the Red List. The Red List shows you what animals are in danger and endangered and are disappearing, you know? Um, that is the important thing. And they have come up with an idea called 30 by 30, which uh, my friend Doug brought up on a previous podcast. We were talking about this, 30 by 30. They've started an initiative, again, signed by every country except for the United States, unfortunately. 30% um, of the oceans protected by 2030. Now, it is a very aggressive move and they're asking for every country to work together because our solution needs to be a worldwide response. And, and how could the concept of preserving the world for your children become um, offensive to you? Or how could you not want to participate in that? You know, really the only people that want to participate in it are the ones that are making the money out of the oil and gas companies. I mean, everybody else wants to protect their children to have safe water. Uh, now, the, the interesting thing about the 30 by 30 challenge is a lot of countries are doing great. The UK pledged the support um, and they called the launch of the Global Ocean Alliance signed by 10 countries. I think this is awesome. Belgium, Belize, Costa Rica, Finland, Gabon, Kenya. Oh my gosh, I cannot pronounce that. I know it's pronounced different than I um, have. Sorry, um, my medicine, sometimes I have, uh, I have trouble speaking. Anyway, um, Palau, Portugal, and one at Vanuatu are all, and they recently joined by Sweden and Germany. And, you know, this is pretty cool. This is the world um, finally starting to pay attention to the fact that we need to preserve what we have. And, you know, other countries that don't preserve what they don't have, it bleeds into us because when they run out of fish, they come to us. Um, another great example of again of collapsed fisheries and the danger is the extinction to certain animals one in particular that i have a very strong passion for is the pink dolphin within the amazon um, there is a type of fish in colombia that is very popular it's a catfish and they actually overfished all of their fisheries and it's gone it's just gone so what they did was start buying another catfish from brazil and this catfish was being, you know, uh, introduced in stores as the, as the other name of the other catfish, right? Now, the problem here is that the catfish in Brazil eats flesh. So it, it's really disgusting. It's, it's the only thing that's carnivorous, that's a catfish that's, that's like that, that'll eat human flesh, whatever flesh. So this catfish uh, also eats, you know, so people in Brazil won't touch that catfish. They didn't know that it was also being sold to them under different names until there was a study done in Manaus and they actually busted them for that. But so what happens though is, back to the pink dolphins, um, the pink dolphins are considered a bit of a nuisance by the fishermen. And what they'll do is actually kill the pink dolphins and cut their body up into little teeny pieces. And the pink dolphins are so oily that they get off this huge oil scent and it draws all the catfish because they like dead uh, the catfish in Brazil here, they like these dead, uh, they're called pericatinga, they like dead flesh. Um, so that is all to feed somebody else's hole. You know, that is, <laughs> it didn't sound right. That is all to feed somebody else's gap in fisheries sustainability. You know, they collapse their own fishery. They still need fish. The fish looks like the fish that they had. So there we go. It's all, all for that. Um, you know, it, le it has a lot of unintended consequences. And no company's success, no boardrooms, QR, quarterly report, nobody's stock is more important than the next generation having an earth, having drinking water, having fish, having animals, having oxygen. You know, uh, I know it all sounds a bit dramatic, but all of these things are connected. You know, we have to remember, uh, for some reason, they always say that the, the Amazon is the, the lungs of the world. But in truth, 
um, the ocean is. You know, if the ocean, they always say if the ocean dies, we die. And it's true because the ocean creates all of our moisture. It creates all of our sustainability in life. And like I said, they call it Earth. But it really, Earth is just ocean, 70, over 70 percent ocean, you know, um, and we are destroying that ocean. Now, there are solutions. Go to the 30 by 30. Find your local chapter that can do it. Go to your go to the Facebook link. Go find your local rights of nature chapter that you can join up with and, and help with, that you can protect your groundwater areas. You know, um, the more places we allow the environment to be the environment, the more places that we as people can continue to be people, you know? And so we need to find a way to work together. Um, everything is not a resource put here for us. And this removal of the MPA, I was very disappointed with. But again, you know, MPAs are long-term things. We have to keep our eyes on the prize. We have to remember that we can still get protection for it. You know, we can still get protection for it. Um, and there are always ways. And right now, 30 by 30 is, is promoting it. Um, you know, a lot of the rights of nature are promoting it. We just have to hit it at every legal way that we can and find ways. And, you know, that's the thing. When you get to an MPA, you're talking about dealing with politicians. So politicians are not always the problem. Um, the problem are the private corporations that buy the politicians and the private corporations, if you're in America, that are allowed to write laws uh, under what's called ALEC. And if you're not familiar with ALEC, E-A-L-E-C, check it out. It's where lobbyists actually write laws for congressmen and then push them through. Um, so even what's happening is all special interest. So very disappointing, and I'm very concerned for all the fishermen, especially up in the Northeast, because a lot of these issues are going to continue. You know, um, the fish stocks are going to get depleted again. Because I can guarantee you that once those big commercial fleets get into that marine protected area, and they and they they destroy it all, and we lose the, all those, uh, you know, close to 100 forms of rare coral, all the other animals that live down there, all the biodiversity, all the things that make it, and then they leave it, destructed, and it's turned into a dead zone. Where are they going to go? They're going to keep going, and they're not going to leave because now we've made that fishing grounds. So. You know, it's a fascinating topic. Marine protected areas are super important. It is a place where we need to, just like the, the bad guys, you know, they hobble the, the border between enforcement and no enforcement, high seas and protected area, um, anywhere around land. They're always um, surrounding the MPAs. Um, it's incredible what they, get, what they get away with. And as they're getting away with it, the oceans are starting to starve and soon, a lot of the people will as well. And this is it. We need to find a resolution between these companies and us. You know, um, if they need to exploit for fossil fuel, we need to have it done in a way that when they're done, they don't leave the earth a graveyard. Sherry says, wherever you are, you can help reach out. Mitch Allen says, Overturn Citizens United. Ah. Citizens United is the, one of the craziest things. If you're not familiar with Citizens United, if you're, if you're not from the U.S., it is a law that was passed that allows corporations to be treated like people. So uh, this is what led to things like the animal ag gag law, um, where if I expose animal agriculture in a negative light, I can be tried on a federal court because I hurt the feelings. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Or in the reputation of that other person known as whatever, Smithfield Farms or whatever. Absolutely absurd. The people that are destroying the planet have the same protections now that humans have. And the planet itself literally has almost no protections aside from MPAs and anything else that we can get past locally. So it's a calling. We need to jump up. This 30 by 30 is a beautiful program. And I really encourage everybody to go check it out. And Mitch, uh, Center for Environmental Rights. Thank you, Mitch. Appreciate it. Molly says, even have some of the fish in, ah, geez, in Horse Creek have worms. See, and this is the problem. Like, um, you know, by allowing these companies to openly pollute. And right now, unfortunately, there is zero anybody watching. Um, all these companies are self-regulated. So, um, you know, when we look at all of the accelerated cancer rates around bodies of water, 
We look at the accelerated pollution rates around um, areas where there are these companies what we find is a connection. It's a very, it's a very simple one to draw. You know, as long as they're allowed to pollute for profit, we will continue to pay the price, and your kids will pay the price, and your grandkids will pay the price, and their grandkids will pay the price. And you know, this is one of those things where I really feel we all need to be on the right side of history. Um, we cannot go throw our bodies into the gears to protect corporations. If we're going to throw our bodies in the gears, let's do it to protect the earth and to protect our families. Because that's what's more important, you know. Um, the boardrooms, profit, quarterly profit doesn't matter, and we can't pretend like it does, and we can't justify the loss of environment for profit. There's nothing about that that can do. You know, the U.S. is pretty amazing. We have so much great open land. If you ever take a uh, road trip to the U.S., it's beautiful. It's amazing. Until you get to places like some areas in Texas, kind of gnarly and gross, and smells like burnt oil, but some really nasty areas um, where there's a lot of oil production. But for the most part, the U.S. has done an incredible job. Now, the reason is, is environmentalists started popping up. You know, um, the U.S. used to be this vast, beautiful place. And then all of a sudden, there was so much destruction that people like John Muir started to speak up. People started to speak up. So we, we have, what we have left is a real gift. And we can't give that gift to other countries so they can feed their people cheap fish. It's just not worth the price that we have to pay. Um, let's see, Molly, and practices on the outside. Exactly, and Molly, you know, once we've opened that MPA, every country, you know, um, when, when you look at it, between Ecuador, what they got there, they can easily just pop right over now as well and, and go exploit this MPA. Uh, and there is literally no regulation, there's no enforcement the, the most infuriating thing to me that i saw when i traveled uh, especially with mpas is the lack of enforcement um, people just do not budget it they don't care company corporations don't care and most corporations own most governments and governments don't care corporations don't care the only people that care are us the people that have to drink the water or eat the fish or deal with the loss generationally Camilla says, fish are loaded with plastic. You know what, Camilla, that's a great point too. There is so much microplastic in our oceans that we have to stop thinking of them as these pure, beautiful, clean areas. Um, fishing in itself is problematic in the sense that there are so many microplastics that were tested around the world. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but they found that everyone eats one credit card worth of plastic a week without knowing it through our water, through our food, um, and through our exposure. So we have a lot of plastics, um, and it's, it's terrible. Uh, that's very dangerous, you know? Um, so that's a good point, Camilla. Mitch says, rights of nature will always struggle to get laws passed as long as Citizens United exist. Absolutely, Mitch. Yeah, Citizens United was, a, I think, it was one of the biggest collective what that our country has ever had. <laughs> and you're right, Sherry, we need to be on the right side of nature. Uh, Molly says, replying to Camilla, my son was scraping them off and putting them back. Oh, my gosh. Oh, Molly. That's just, you know, and it's terrible to see. And, Molly, I know that your family lives very organically and very naturally. And you guys have always had a wonderful relationship with your local nature and with your local rivers. And I know you've seen that change over time, um, you know, and, and this is it. This is that we're all engaged in this one battle, which is I think it's the same on every front, whether it's an MPA it's rights of nature. It's trying to stop the extraction manufacturers like Mosaic or protect places like Cancer Alley. What we find is what I always call the cancer of the body politic, where the corporations are allowed to control how the local governments run. Um, and when Florida passed that recent Senate bill, they did the same thing. They took away local jurisdiction for groundwater coverage and water coverage. So really nasty. Um, he said they saved a lot of fish today. Wow. It's very sad, Eric, when these big corporations move into small towns and the people that live there depend on these companies for their livelihood. Yes, this is the complicated part of it. It's hard to convince them that their paychecks are from the same people that are poisoning them. Absolutely, Sherry, that's a great point that you bring up. It's difficult and it's complicated because 
you know, uh, for example, mining is a great example. Mining is a culture, right? Mining, there are generations of miners. Um, but over the last 40 years, 50 years, things have gotten more dangerous in the in these in these areas. And the, the we're only now starting to have the scientific knowledge to be able to see what they're doing to the world around them. So mining has always been a culture. It's a thing that goes on, but it's a very destructive practice. And Sherry, you know, that's a good point. Like the people that work there, they're just trying to eat. Now, this again comes back into conservation. Okay, they have to eat and they have to feed their families, right? But they have to go to a place that's, that's going to give them cancer. They have to go somewhere that's going to give them all these different cancers. These places where people have to go work, they're risking their life for a paycheck. And it's, an un, it's just unnecessary. Um, and they don't have any other options. They just don't have any options. They're going to go to the chemical plant and they're going to get cancer when they leave it. And this is messed up. So what do we do? Do we say to them, continue? This is good. Like, continue on. I guess everything's fine. Or do we find a way to get better jobs for these people in these neighborhoods? You know, um, is there a way that we can change this around? You know, and it's very difficult because we have these massive companies and maybe not. And maybe these companies will stay. And if they do, then we have to always remember that we are the sliding scale um, of morality between the destruction of the environment and the continuation of the corporation. You know, these two things may always be there. And if they're always there, we are in the middle and we are allowed to say how much we will tolerate from them. And we have ways we can fight back. We can do this. I'm very excited. Um, but yeah, very good point, Sherry. And my heart always goes out to the workers in these places because they're being having to go into very dangerous areas. They're not being told the truth. Um, they suffer from it greatly. Their families will suffer from it greatly. And, you know, like when you go back to mineral extraction, you know, um, what, you know, what are we going to do? We need to find a better way forward. People need to be able to survive and they shouldn't have to put their health on the line to do it. Gary Pittman is a wonderful example. If you guys don't know Gary, Google him, check out his book, um, Toxic Torts, Phosphate Mining and Toxic Torts. Gary worked in a, um, a um, mining chemical facility for a long time, was a manager there, and got so sick afterwards and became an advocate for health after that. So he shouldn't have had to pay with his health you know, his family shouldn't have had to pay with his health just so they could eat. So the problem is even bigger than, you know, and business as usual is not going to fix it. So we have to find a new way to do that. SB712. Thank you, Sherry. That's the one that actually um, has destroyed the local, um, the local groups from being able to protect their own environments. And the sneakiest part is they made it sound like it was going to be good for everybody to protect their water. But that's how the government is, right? Every time they say it, it's the opposite of what they name it. Um, yeah, and, and Molly, exactly. Nozaic, great group. They are out trying to mitigate all this damage that's being done to the waters. Uh, big fan of Nozaic. Um, how can we change? Sherry, interesting question. We say the same thing about farmers. How can we change this? We need to be able to work together. Exactly. Um, you know, my family are farmers. We have we had a small farm for a long time in Illinois. And um, first there was the GMO destruction through Monsanto of, of you know, doing the thing where they, where they let it cross pollinate through the air. Um, and that started to lead to a lot of economic instability for smaller farmers. Then Monsanto was suing the smaller farmers uh, and created a huge path of destruction. Do we have smaller farmers? Not necessarily. There may be a few that are local. And if you have a smaller farmer, please go to that farmer to buy your veggies and your fruits because support them. Most of them have been squeezed out. Most of what we have are just giant ag companies that are spraying tons of pesticides, tons of cancer-causing chemicals, tons of glyphosate all around the water. And that water is being fed back into the groundwater and poisoning all of us. Um, we need to grow food. But do we, um, do we want to kill ourselves? 
to eat and, that, and you know and it's a problem and it is a problem because with every population they say well we need to feed more people how do we do it the problem is it's not working right now you know uh, and that's another thing i want to bring about up about the mpas uh right now especially the idea that opening an mpa is going to lead to more money for fishermen is is 100 percent the opposite of the truth and the reason is simple right now with the covid crisis the economy is tanked everybody is broke the demand for fish has dropped to a fourth of what it was in the united states to reopen an mpa you're suddenly going to introduce the bigger companies that are going to come in now they're going to fulfill the fish thing at a lower cost right so what happens is the fishermen again will lose out because we have a broken supply right now there's one fourth the demand and we're about to have 10 times the amount which means the average daily catch and the average small independent businessman is what they have is going to be worthless it's it's a very common tactic it was used in the amazon same thing that they do they hire poor people and say you're going to go log for us illegally they don't know it's illegal whatever they do but they go log and they say we will pay you a hundred dollars a tree good deal here's the chainsaw here's the boat go to it whatever um they come back say with 10 logs right now the company has say, given the same offer to 10 people in the village so 10 people come back with 10 logs suddenly the 10 logs are their 10 logs out of 100 and they're not worth as much and they have given the loggers even the illegal loggers gas equipment so now all of a sudden the illegal loggers come out with almost nothing and in order to just keep eating they get stuck in a cycle of of poverty that has to keep going back and forth and unfortunately it's a misnomer the idea that you know um opening this mpa will give fishermen more jobs right now it's actually going to if anything bankrupt a lot of them and create a huge problem for them and we will see them becoming extinct as these policies continue we just you know it makes no sense um and again the mpas are not generally where fishing happens what happens is the idea is that it's so biologically diverse that all the fish breed and then the entire place gets healthier and then everybody gets a rise up and then all the fishing is better and we have seen successful stories of it happen so you know uh again um, i'm not i don't eat fish uh for those of you that do please understand that it is an insanely destructive um an insanely destructive um, in, um, insanely destructive area and we just don't need it you know right now uh, and if we do have it please let's fight to preserve areas so that we can maintain it because otherwise all the fish are going to go extinct and all the fishermen are going to go extinct you know and um, and then they're going to be like wow how, how did this happen you know we already see it happening so we can stop it now we have an ability you know um, just like with the IUCN red list we have an ability to know what's going to go extinct and try to find methods to protect. Uh, at the moment, as, as Rachel Carson said, a war against nature is a war against ourselves. Leaving nature unhealthy leaves us unhealthy. Taking from nature and killing it kills us on a global scale. So we need to be healthy as a group together. And we can do this, you know, that we have some great solutions out here. Um, so there we go. And uh, yeah, Mitch says, if you want to see how insane Florida is, check out Mike Nepper and his death spraying video. Oh yeah, Mike Nepper is an amazing documentarian. Uh, Mike Nepper gets to the bottom of it. He's wonderful. Um, and his work in Florida has been incredible. Uh, highly educated guy and uh, just knows exactly what he's talking about. He's a wonderful resource. And uh, he's a nonpartisan resource. So that means you can believe it, you know. You know? Um, there's never going to be an environmental solution through one party. It's 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 a it's a two party problem. It's a two party solution. It's a one world, you know, and it's our world. Let's talk about it, as we always say. So thanks for being on today. I'm glad we got to go over MPAs, their legal protection frameworks, um, the dangers of how people come in and and do them, and the danger now of repealing an MPA, um, especially in the time when the last thing that small fishermen are going to need with a, a you know all the demand of their fish gone is tons 
of giant commercial enterprises offering cheap stuff now and exporting it out for more cheap stuff. This was a, a step backwards. Um, and so I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention because we have so many steps forward going on, um, and which is good because we need it. Um, but, you know, watch out because the entire United States coastline is now up for sale to the oil and gas industry. So those rigs you see, the explosion in the Gulf, you know, the things that we know that happen in the Gulf are now going to be dotting the landscape of all of our shorelines. And we can reverse this, though. Uh, Camilla says, we have to put our taste, habits, tradition, and convenience above our planet's ability to survive. We can't expect it to continue providing. We shall all, we all should do our best where possible to plant and grow our own food. Absolutely. I am excited. You know, I, I'm looking forward to kind of getting out of a city and getting more back to nature. I love gardening. Uh, I grow awesome cherry tomatoes. Awesome cherry tomatoes. So it's my specialty. Um, grow really good oregano and a few other things that grow much like tomatoes. <laughs> um, and Camilla's right. We have to, I think what she was saying is, um, she was. I think there's a typo there, because she says we have to put our stuff above our planet's ability to survive. What she is saying, and I know Camilla, what she is saying is that all of these things, we, we can't look at a choice from our own selfish perspective anymore. Um, you know, for example, and please don't be upset with me, shrimp. Shrimp is one of the leading causes of destruction and bycatch in the entire world. It is one of the worst things you can do to the environment is eat shrimp. And I'm sorry, I know people are gonna be mad at me for saying that, but here's the thing, when you think about shrimp, don't think, oh, I like that, and that's yummy, and you know that little red sauce is so good. Think about the entirety of the death and destruction, and is it essential? And, you know, we have to become a little bit more, um, you know, we have a free market. We can teach fishermen what we want. We can curtail these destructive practices by buying from your local fishermen instead of a major fisherman, you know, more artisan, hand caught. You know, um, there's a lot of examples in that. Maybe we'll get back into that at some point too. Um, and uh, yeah, and Molly says eat herbs every day. Molly, I agree 100%. We definitely need to, um, you know, we definitely need to keep as much as we can. Oh, and Camilla, I see. I'm sorry. I misread what you wrote. What you're saying is we have already put our taste, habits, tradition, and convenience above the planet. Um, I was reading it as we have to. So I, I, my mistake. I read that incorrectly. So Camilla typed it. Yeah, uh, we, ha we have already put it. We have put our taste, habits, tradition, and convenience above our planet's ability. And it's true. We believe in... in um, a, a, an ocean that has no, it's boundless, it has no ends. And all of us that work in conservation know that's not true. Um, but again, shrimp. Yeah, Molly, thank you. Shrimp bed. <laughs> uh, no, no shellfish. That's good, Mitch. Um, for multiple reasons. One, for the microplastics. Two, for the, you know, the way that they're collected and harvested. And three, um, I mean, really with 7% of the fisheries out there still working, um, is it that important that we eat fish? <laughs> Just throwing it out there. Some people might say yes. Some people might say no. I guess it depends um, on your personal eating habits anyway. So, but be careful. And my friends that do eat fish, be cautious. You have a lot of microplastic. Make sure it's not being mislabeled. Um, frozen fish is very dangerous. You know, if you can see it whole, if you can buy it from a local guy, that's going to be your best chance. Um, let that massive production of fish industry just kind of fall to the wayside in the grocery stores and show them what you want is to know what you're what's going in what do you have you know um <clears throat> yeah, and mitch true we think all natural resources are endless couldn't be exactly couldn't be further from the truth you know we really we have a limited world and uh in a hundred years we've almost destroyed it <laughs> you know like that's messed up but you know um in the same ways that we went to in the industrial revolution without considering the consequences. We now are smarter and we have the consequences and we have the internet. So we have a new way to understand, to relate to the world and to change the world. And together we can do it. 
You know, uh, we are a niche, us conservationists slash environmentalists, however you want to label yourself. We're a niche, but you know what? We're a niche worldwide, which makes us actually, when you look at our numbers, a majority. So don't forget that. We are a majority. You might not have many friends in your neighborhood that care about recycling or where the fish come from or MPAs or microplastics or any of that stuff. But it doesn't matter because we're out there. We're all here. We're together. And we have have ways to find each other nowadays. So it's a beautiful thing. And that's what it is. You know, the connection is going to create a giant, a giant voice, one big voice that can overwhelm the white noise of advertisers and big companies, you know, together we're one voice and we're one heart and we are heartbeats together. And I always say it, but the only way that we're ever going to defeat all of this exploitation is through love, through acts of love, because we need our actions to be the opposite of what they're doing in every way, shape and form. And the earth needs us to act kindly, properly and compassionately towards the earth, towards each other and towards all the animals. Uh, I agree, Mitch. Together, we can definitely do more. And Mitch, thank you so much for being on today, too. Big fan of Mitch's um, weekend.com. Go check it out. It's a wonderful bipartisan group. Nosaic, another group trying to get water filtered correctly. Check out the rights of nature. They're fighting for that area. Um, as I always mention, my friend Stell and her group of, of dedicated people. There, it's, I always talk about Stell, but, um, and Stell doesn't like would always want me to, to remind everybody that there's actually a huge team um, of people that work at Fight for Zero, fightforzero.org, uh, all spelled out except for the number. Go check them out. They can also assist you with not only water testing, but water quality issues in your local area. Remember, it's all our water. It's a natural resource. We were born here. It doesn't matter what country you're from. It doesn't matter what society you live in. And it doesn't matter what um, companies exist. We were born into the world and the world's water is ours. It's our resource. And remember, we are the majority. And uh, yes, remember the by the people part of our constitution. Exactly. We lost control of that around 1900 with the Industrial Revolution. And now we have to get it back. And we can do that as our brains click on one by one. The more conversations we have with each other, the more conversations we have with people that don't believe in what we're saying, the more opportunities we have to put kindness and to put solutions out into the world. So go check out that 30 by 30. Go check out these other groups. It is our water. Let's let's keep the change going. Let's remember it's our world. Let's talk about it. Anyway, I'm very excited. Thanks everybody for being on today. Super lively discussion. And I love seeing that. And thank you all for educating me and joining in. And, and we can all teach each other on great ways to move forward. And like I always say, you know, it's our world. Let's talk about it. We can do this. We do outnumber them. Like I always say, you might feel like you're in the minority because you're a conservationist, you're an environmentalist. But remember, when you think about that niche worldwide, everybody, you are in a majority. We are all one together. All right. Love you guys, too. Thank you for being here.